Thanks, Jane, for bringing those this morning. Well, good morning and welcome to Kidman Baptist Church. We're still in Luke's Gospel. We're still in the last week before Jesus' crucifixion. Only a couple of days left. A lot of teaching has gone on and will go on before he is crucified. And here we are on Palm Sunday. Here we are on Palm Sunday. So I'm going to give you a quick review. I'll try to emphasize the quick. To get into chapter 18, we get to verse 32. And we realize that Jesus and the disciples are heading toward Jerusalem. They've come down from the northeast. They've come down to the southeast. So they didn't have to go through Samaria. And they're heading to Jerusalem. they got to go through Jericho. And a 6,000 feet climb from Jericho up to Jerusalem. So when you see in the Bible it says up to Jerusalem, it's up to Jerusalem. And we saw Jesus just before they get to Jericho. A blind man named Bartimaeus calls out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And we took a Sunday on that and realized that son of David was, was, was a true statement. They understood who the son of David was. A lot of the folks, most of the Jews, would understand who the son of David was. Messiah had to come from David. So he's saying, Messiah. Have mercy upon me. And we find out that not only did Jesus heal Bartimaeus, but he saved him, and he became a follower of Jesus. And as he gets into Jericho, then we he's looking for a, a little tiny guy named Zacchaeus. And I sang you the song once. I'm not going to do it again, of course, but little Zacchaeus went into a tree, and he... Anyway, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> the song says he goes in for tea. To Zacchaeus' house, and of course the Pharisees are just upset so bad because this is a sinner. Zacchaeus was the head taxpayer from the head town that collected taxes, which was Jericho. And we find out in verse 10 of chapter 19, Jesus makes it very clear that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Key verse of chapter 19, I believe. We haven't circled it, circle it. That's why he came. To seek and save the lost. And of course, he saves Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus becomes a follower of Jesus. And we're still on our way to Jerusalem. He tells him a parable. He tells him a parable about the return of the king. And when the king comes back, the king is going to offer rewards. But he also tells him that he's going to offer judgment. He's going to offer judgment to those who don't follow the king. Great parable. Great parable. So he's heading to Jerusalem. So he goes by a, a little town called Bethany. Bethany and Bethphage. And they're not far from each other. About two miles outside of Jerusalem. Lazarus, who he just, he just raised from the dead three or four weeks earlier. Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they own the house. They go to stay there. And Jesus says to two of the disciples, he says, and this is where Palm Sunday comes in, he says, go down the road a bit and get a little a colt of a donkey and bring it to me. Tell the guy that the Lord needs this colt. And he does, and they do. And of course, you know the story then. From, from there, Jesus gets on the colt, and he heads down the two miles through the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. Fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, 9, that says, the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to get on a colt of a donkey. Amazing detail. And he does. And they're shouting hosannas and they're doing the palm branch stuff, right? It's great. Messiah. Wonderful. And he gets to Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem. The crowd's cheering. And as he approaches Jerusalem... Chapter 19, verse 41, tells us what? He looks at Jerusalem and he weeps. And the Greek word actually means sobs. Because he knows what's coming. He knows Jerusalem's going to get destroyed. He knows the people are going to get destroyed. 
He knows he's going to get crucified. He, he knows all of this stuff. The judgment's going to come upon him. He also knows, and this breaks my heart to think about it, that he's the one that's going to judge them. And he weeps. He weeps. He gets to the temple, and you know what happens. He cleanses the temple. He's cleansed, he cleansed the temple before, as he started his ministry three years earlier, and here he is, cleaning out the temple again. The money changers, the business dealings that are going on in the temple. And the next day, it says, he was teaching in the temple. And we had some good times with that the last few years. He's teaching in the temple. He knows he's dying in a couple of days. And here he is getting some stuff through. He, he's got to get some of these doctrines through. And he's confronted by the leaders. Of course. They hate us. They hate him. They hate him. What authority do you have to do this, Jesus? You're called Messiah. You don't say it's not. I'm not Messiah. You come in. You got thousands of people. Some of the commentaries say there may have been ten thousand people. Like, are you kidding me? Thousands of people. I mean, they're there anyway for to Passover, but it's because of this Messiah. Thing. All the miracles he's done. What authority do you have in this? And what authority do you have to clean out, clean out the temple? And now you're teaching in the temple. Of course, Jesus doesn't give him an answer. He gives him a parable. <laughs> That's his answer. And then he gives this most important parable you hardly ever hear spoken. He talks about what? He talks about the Father sending the Son. And the leadership killed the Son. And from there... They find out in this parable. And they understood it was them that he was talking to. That they're going to get killed. And they're going to be replaced. Now that replacement had already started. I think we spent a half a sermon on it. They're going to be replaced by others. Who's the others? And we got into that pretty good. The apostles, the disciples... They started it off. Later on, we find out evangelists and pastors and teachers become the others based on the writings of the apostles. They get replaced. And of course, the hatred grows. And a couple of weeks ago, we took a look at how the Pharisees handled it. The Pharisees we got to get them. But the only ones that can kill them are the Romans. We've got to get Jesus to turn against the Romans. we got to get him to say something against the Romans. If, if Jesus can say something against the Romans, they will arrest him. And if they arrest him, the people will realize he's not Messiah because they expected, as we saw in Sunday school this morning, they expected the Messiah to come and wipe out the Romans. They knew their Old Testament. At least they thought they did. They knew their Old Testament. When Messiah comes, he's going to put the enemies of God, meaning Israel, under their feet, under his feet. And you can go to Joshua chapter 10 and find out what that means. That means execute. He'll come and he'll wipe out. That's what they thought. That's what they thought. But Jesus doesn't get caught in this trick. As, of course, he didn't. Render under Caesars, that's what it is, Caesars. Render under God's, that's what it's about. And God owns you. You do what God tells you to do. So the Pharisees did not succeed in tricking him into that. So the Sadducees, last week, we took a look at the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection as the Pharisees did. There's no such thing as a resurrection. We live for now. Moses didn't tell us there's a resurrection. The Sadducees were the experts in the first five books of the Bible. We call it the Pentateuch, right? He didn't say anything about a resurrection. So therefore, there's no resurrection. So, let's trick Jesus. So we got to hear about this woman that married five guys. Remember that widow last week? Nobody remembers? Yep. One bride for seven guys? 
One would die. She would marry another one. The brother marry another one to seven. And thankfully, she died. So, Jesus. Which one does she marry in heaven? Who's his wife? Which one's, which one's her husband in heaven? And Jesus had the opportunity then of explaining to them about the resurrection. They thought this was a bunch of bull. That's modern terms. A bunch of bull. They didn't believe in a resurrection. And they made, he made it very clear then, when you go to Matthew's account on this, you guys, you experts, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know those scriptures. Moses at the burning bush. God's talking to Moses. And he says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Not I was. These three guys are here now. There's a resurrection. Don't you ever forget it, folks. There is a resurrection. Fascinating to me how he handled Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Then it tells us that they lost courage. They lost courage. They didn't ask him any more questions. They didn't try to trick him anymore. It's amazing to me. What a Savior we have. What a Savior. And that takes us to today. So turn with me to Luke chapter 20. And we'll begin at verse 41 today. I'll read verse 40 first. The Sadducees, they didn't have courage to question him any longer about anything. They were done, folks. And when 70 A.D. came, 40 years later, when Jerusalem got wiped out by Titus, you never hear of the Sadducees again in any rooms at all. Verse 41. And then Jesus said to them, How is it that they say the Christ, the Messiah, is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he his son? Brief prayer. Folks, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, as we open your word again, we just ask that you'll guide and direct us in this wonderful passage as our Lord explains it. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. There is no way any Eastern father would ever, under any circumstances, call his son Lord. And yet, David's son is also called David's Lord. The greatest debate in human history, I believe, is the debate on the nature of Jesus. Was Jesus God? Is he God? Or is he merely a man? We could be up here for several weeks discussing this one. I believe the general consensus in this world today would be that Jesus is a good guy. He lived. He died. He was a very compassionate guy. He was devout, very religious, wise, well-intended maybe. But he's a man. He's merely a man. I believe that would be the general response by the folks today. And Satan and his minions love this. And they would promote that. Because if Jesus is merely a man, then he's not God. And if he's not God, he's not your Savior. If he's not your Savior, the Bible ain't true. The Bible's not true. And if the Bible's not true, Christianity is not genuine. It's a false religion. On the other hand, if Jesus is God, and he is, he's sovereign. He's in charge. The Bible is true. And Christianity, true Christianity, is genuine. 
This is the critical issue of every person that ever lived. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? And it amazes me as I sit in my office a few weeks ago, and I'm rhyming off in my head all the different denominations that I know that believe Jesus was not God. Of course, you've got the, the Muslims, the Jews, the Hindus, you've got the Christadelphians, you've got the Scientologists, the JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, and on and on and on. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we believe in the Bible. Just, we just, there's no way Jesus is God. Anybody here ever have two white shirts with ties come to your door and knock on your door on a Sunday afternoon? Just five of us? The rest of you are hiding behind your couch in the living room? As your pastor, I've talked about light and salt. If you haven't heard that sermon or two or three, then we'll do it again next week. Yes, we have to be the light. But yes, we have to be the salt. And I would encourage you to be the salt. Don't hide. Oh, Bruce, I just don't want to say to them. I, I really don't want to talk to them, especially on Sunday afternoon. I get the Sunday afternoon thing. Open the door. Don't argue with them. Say this. If you don't believe what Jesus said, Jesus said, I am. If you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Period. And if you want to go on, then you go to John. Philip said to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. A little bit earlier, he says, what? The Father and I are one. Have a nice day. Click, shut the door. You planted the seed. You planted the seed. And you can come to me on Sunday and say, I was salty this week. <laughs> I was salty this week. They reject the deity of Jesus Christ. If he is God, this is true Christianity. And so the target of false, by false religion, it's always going to be the person of Jesus Christ. If they hate you, Bruce, remember this. They hated me first. Okay? We can have differences. You and I, actually some of you and I could have differences on some of the gray areas of Scripture. That's okay. That's okay. You'll be wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> but the consistency of true Christianity is Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Anything less is not Christian. It's not. The Jews didn't believe that when Messiah came that he was God. He would be God. He was merely a man. He was endowed by God. He'd be given special privileges. He would be given special powers by God, and he would be greater than any other man, any other person, but he's still just a man. They didn't see the Messiah as God, as Son of God, as a Savior of sinners. They didn't see him like that at all. He's only a man. And that's what they were taught. And they had been for several hundred years. They started right with Ezra, the Pharisees. You claim to be God, Jesus? You claim to be the Messiah? That's blasphemy in their eyes. Jesus doesn't leave it there. He, he becomes a little salty himself. And we've seen that these last few weeks. He assaults their theology. He assaults their, their power, their influence, the position that they have. And they love that position. Big time. And we even go back, right back to the fourth of Luke, Luke chapter 4, the self-righteousness. They're they're self-righteous. They know how to get to heaven by what they do. And he assaulted that time after time after time. He exposes their hypocrisy, their corruption. And of course, that didn't help their hatred. It just increased it and increased it, as we have seen these last this last week. And of course, this is the last week before Calvary. Unsuccessfully, 
They confronted him. And then verse 40 says what? For they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. But he doesn't stop there. That would have been a good place for Jesus to lay down and have a couple days rest before he's going to get killed. No. Perfect opportunity for him. It's his turn now to lead the conversation. And this would be his last conversation with them. What would you say if you were Jesus? What would you talk about if you were Jesus? It should be pretty important because I'm dying in a couple of days. It should be probably one of the most important matters ever. And it was. And it was. He asked them a question, verse 41. Then Jesus says to them, How is it that they say the Messiah, the Christ, is David's son? Matthew 22 and, and uh, Mark 12 also talk about this, if you want to dig into this a little bit deeper. Why is Jesus bringing this up? Why is he bringing it up now? What's the point of going back and clarifying who he is? He's done this before. Why would you do it now? Well, Mark chapter 12 gives us a clue. It's more than a clue. Verse 34. This is the same passage, only Luke didn't bring this in. Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, they didn't ask him any more questions. What was going on here? He knew some were this close to becoming believers, true believers. True believers. And you know from Scripture, and we may talk about it Friday, I'm not sure yet, but Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee. He became a believer. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a believer. We find out later in Acts, many other Pharisees became believers. This was Jesus' last shot at evangelism before he went to the cross. Final evangelical effort by Jesus. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, still standing around listening to this. Now, these guys, these elite are the rejectors of Jesus. They reject, on behalf of the nation, they had rejected him. The crowds were fickle. Well, we know that from way back, and we'll know that again when they asked him to be crucified. A fickle crowd. They were weak, indecisive. They couldn't decide to follow Jesus. And yet, he still is compassionate evangelist, wanting every last one of them to get saved. Inviting sinners, knowing they're headed for hell, to avoid that, to know him, who he truly is. To give up all this rejection stuff, all this indecision stuff. No wonder Jesus wept back in 19. No wonder he wept. Verse 41. If you don't get any other point today, folks, let's get this point. The, the truth about Jesus is absolutely imperative. It's essential for salvation. You have to know who he is to get saved. And this is clear throughout the scriptures. John 5, 37. 1 John 2, 22 is a good one. I'll take you there. 1 John 2, 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? The one who denies that the, fa of the Father and the Son. John 5, 37. It's that you have no relationship with the Father unless what? Unless you confess the truth about the Son. Well, Bruce, I worship God. I don't know about this Jesus stuff. But I worship God. No, 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 no. You have no relationship with the Father unless you confess the truth about the Son. Period. Period. And you can talk about the parable of the prodigal son. We haven't got time again today, but we will. you could if you're witnessing to somebody about this. The older brother who represents the Pharisees, the elite, complaining. Complaining about his brother. You know, he hangs around with the sinners, the prodigals. And we can talk about the father. I like to think of that as the parable of the love 
loving Father. Consider who Jesus is and receive the blessing. That blessing comes when you realize that he will accept you. When you are repenting of your sin and asking for forgiveness, you're in forever. You're in. The pertinent question here is Matthew 22, verse 41. Matthew 22. It's amazing how when you study these things, you've got to tie them together in some regard. Verse 41 says, and this is, same, this is the same time, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them the question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And what did they answer? Whose son is he? David's son. We all know he's David's son. The Messiah is David's son. We've known that. We know the scriptures. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? They believed, they believed that the Messiah was merely a man. He was a gifted man, a blessed man. But he was also the son of David. He asked a direct but a very, very important question. And this is I believe this is the core, the, the absolute core of true spirituality. The answer was David's. David's son. And that was true. Absolutely true. You can go to 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, Amos chapter 9, Micah 5. The Messiah is going to come from David's line. They knew it if they studied their scriptures at all, and most of the Jews had. From David's line. I think it was the last week or the week before. I think it was the last week. We talked about uh, that wonderful love story of Ruth and Boaz. Remember Ruth and Boaz? We talked about, oh yeah, it was last week. We, we talked about the women, the woman having seven husbands and all that stuff. And the reason back then <coughs> somebody in the family had to marry the widow to keep, to keep the tribes going before, before they went into the, Anyway, Boaz marries Ruth. Wonderful love story. Kinsman Redeemer. And they have a son named Obed. And Obed has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has a son named David. And 28 generations later, Jesus of Nazareth. Mary and Joseph. He was in David's line, and they knew it. They knew it. And we find many in the New Testament understood what that meant. He's a Messiah. And we see it. Matthew 9, 12, 15, 20, 21, Luke 18. He's in David's line. The best genealogies are in Matthew 1 and, and uh, Luke chapter 3. And when we were in Luke chapter 3, I think we spent two weeks on <laughs> pretty dry stuff. Genealogy. He's the son of David. <laughs> so it's a correct answer. But it's not good enough. It's deficient, this answer. The leaders were furious because these folks that were calling him son of David, they weren't just calling him son of David that he was from David's line. They were calling him Messiah. And the stew was boiling. They resented it. So we, so we go from a discerning question, a deficient answer, to now we have the divine reality, if you will. And I think this is very key. Verse 42, David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore David calls him Lord. How is he his son? This is amazing. Jesus is quoting Psalm 110. Go back to Psalm 110. 110th Psalm, verse 1. Now, all these guys would know that this psalm is messianic. This is all about the Messiah in 110. They knew, they, they knew and they, they believed that the Messiah would come as a conquering hero. He would wield the right hand of God. He would, he would have the authority and the power of God. 
He would subdue all the nations, the enemies of God, and of course they thought that was the enemies of, of, of Israel. And they would be put under their feet, and I already told you earlier, that meant, from you take this from uh, Joshua chapter 10, that means they get executed. They understood all this. That's what the Messiah. This is Old Testament prophecy. So how is it? If this is Messianic and the Messiah is to be David's son, can you, can you call him Lord? Well, that's because of verse 1 and 110 of our song. The Lord said to my Lord. That's Yahweh talking. That's God the Father talking. Talking to the Messiah. And David says, the Messiah is my Lord. How can the Messiah be David's son and David's Lord? There's only one way. There's only one way. He has to be the eternal God who becomes a man. That's the only way that this can be played in properly. And these guys are stunned. They're absolutely stunned. The Messiah is both man and God. David's son and David's Lord. This reminds me of, well, I guess because I've been studying ahead with Easter coming. I think I've told you in the past how much I love Thomas. Everybody, poor old Thomas, he, he takes a beating. And I, I'm just like Thomas. I guess that's why I love him so much. He was a skeptic big time. We call him the doubting Thomas. Hey, guys, I, they all doubted. And we'll talk about that. You know, I'm not sure if it's Easter I'll talk about it. We'll talk about it soon. They all doubted. They weren't sure. Where, where do we fit with this? But Thomas, he missed out after the resurrection. You remember the first meeting? Jesus came upon the disciples in the room. Thomas wasn't there. When Thomas came back, Jesus was gone, and they, and, and they said, Thomas, Jesus was here. He's risen. Hold it. Hold it. Not a chance. Don't tell me that. Until I see the, the, hand, the hand nail prints, until I see the side, I won't believe. That was Bruce Mason. One week later or thereabouts, Thomas is there this time. Jesus shows up again in his glorified body. We won't get into that. And I'm sure Jesus came right over to him. Okay, Thomas. And what does Thomas say? My Lord... Oh my God. And that was the sermon of the day. And that settled it for Thomas. My Lord and my God. This reminds me of that. This reminds me of that. Let me take two minutes and read Psalm 110. Verse 1 says this. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And that is back to what we said earlier. That's executing the enemies. That's back to Joshua chapter 10. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest for how long? For ever according to the order of Melchizedek, and there's a whole sermon there. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Have you heard about the wrath of God coming in the tribulation period? That's it. And he will judge among the nations. He'll fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. The Jews here, folks, were stopped. Matthew 22, 46. No one was able to answer him a word. Nor did anybody dare from that day on to ask him another question. Folks, if you reject Jesus Christ as God, as Lord and God, you got nowhere else to turn. You have nowhere else to turn. And don't just say to me, Bruce, he's a good guy. You know, this is a wonderful book. 
Don't you dare say that to me. That's not good enough. It's not good enough. You got to believe that he is David's son and Lord. He is the God man, fully God and fully man. I don't understand that completely. But he tells me it's true. And if he tells me it's true, it's true. If you don't believe it, you're denying scripture. If you don't believe it, you're denying scripture. You're believing that Jesus is a fraud. You're believing that this Bible is a lie. That's what you're believing. And if that's the case, I would say to you, get out of Christianity. Get out of Christianity. If you're going to believe that it's not true, get out of this place. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But if you do believe, and I trust everybody here does, you believe that the Bible is true, you believe that Jesus is God, what he says is true, He's the only way to salvation through faith. Believe in him. Believe on him. Get the picture from him and of him that he is the perfect representation of God. And we see it throughout the scripture. The Jews wouldn't believe it. No matter what he did, Luke 22, 66, before he's, before he's going to go to the cross. Well, Jesus, are you, are you the Messiah? He says, look, you guys, you got to be kidding me. Something like that. Even if I tell you again, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. What's the point? It's amazing to me. Like, like from a human standpoint, they saw the miracles. They believed the miracles. They believed in his wisdom. His exposition of scripture was unparalleled. Nobody else talked like Jesus talked. None. His answers. And yet, no. We don't believe you're God. And I wrote a note to myself. That is the sad error of history. And today. What about you? What about us here at Kingman? What do we believe? What's our response to that question? Whose son is Jesus? He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's the Redeemer. He's the Anointed One of Daniel. He's my Savior. I hope he's your Savior too. The only way a sinner can escape hell is through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Holy God, holy man, I hope he's your Savior. Let's pray.